Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending our event this evening. Uh, we're gonna get started now. So welcome to Youth Talk, hashtag BC Poly, Anti-Racism 2020. Um, this is an event to discuss and learn more about the le recent race-based legislation um, that was put forth this week to address systemic racism within British Columbia. My name is Bella and I'm part of the Vancouver Point Grey Youth Council. We're a collective of young people in the Vancouver Point Grey constituency that are passionate about being involved within the community and are interested in politics. Um, we take on projects throughout the year, including this one, like engaging with young people in conversations that are important and impact British Columbians. Um, next, I'd like to welcome our MLA, uh, David Eby, to help us get started. David is the MLA for Vancouver Point Grey and BC's Attorney General and Minister of Housing. Welcome, David. Thanks, Bella. Um, thanks so much for starting us off today. Um, I'll begin by uh, recognizing that uh, uh, many of us on the call today, uh, myself included, are on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and acknowledge uh, my own role in uh, needing to continue to work on reconciliation and partnership with uh, First Nations, uh, and also hope everybody on the call takes a moment to reflect on how they also can help us work towards reconciliation as a province. Um, uh, this is a really exciting night. We have a special guest with us uh, that, and an event that our youth council in Point Grey has organized. Uh, Rachna Singh is the Parliamentary Secretary for Anti-Racism Initiatives. She's a colleague of mine. She works in the Ministry of Attorney General, uh, and uh, she's a friend as well. She's done a lot of amazing work. She's been a drug and alcohol counselor. She's worked with women fleeing violence. Uh, she's organized with employees for their rights. Uh, she's super neat. And last week, she had a really uh, fascinating uh, piece of legislation, uh, an historic day in our legislature, uh, a, a new law that she is currently moving through the legislature uh, as we speak, uh, which is really exciting, that she's going to tell us about our anti-racism data legislation. Uh, so I can't wait for that. But before we get to uh, 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 hearing from Rachna about her work and, uh, and the work of community uh, uh, leaders and racialized communities across the province, and First Nations, um, let me uh, take a moment to thank uh, the Youth Council in Vancouver Point Grey for pulling this event together. Um, Emily, Bella, Shira, Hugh, Yasmin, Sahithi, Rachna, Ayan, and Kelly, thank you so much for your work on this event. And I understand we're also joined tonight by members of the Provincial Youth Council. So thank you for, uh, for coming. If you are a young person, uh, which we are broadly defining uh, as, uh, as being as young as you feel, but if you're a young person that's interested in politics and local issues, uh, and you're interested in learning more about uh, joining the Youth Council, I'm gonna pop my uh, email address into the chat there and uh, just send a message uh, if you're a resident of Vancouver Point Grey uh, to our office and, uh, and get involved. Um, so thanks for coming. Uh, to tell you uh, more about uh, what's coming next, I'd like to welcome Emily up. Uh, she'll share about, uh, about where we're headed. Emily, good to see you. Uh, tell us what's gonna happen tonight. Hi. Um, hi folks, first off, I would like to thank both David and Rachna for being here with us to engage in this crucial conversation today. This discussion is the second of our Youth Talk BC Poly series and a follow-up from an event last spring with David and Rachna discussing anti-racism work in the British Columbia. Today, you will hear from Rachna about what this legislation is, why anti-racism data is important, the engagement process, the framework, and next steps. After her presentation, the audience will be able to ask Rachna and David questions surrounding this legislation. At the end of the discussion, we will send out a feedback survey in which you can also choose to leave your contact information if you'd like to join our Youth Council, receive emails about future youth talks, or keep in touch some other way. I am pleased to pass over to Bella. Hi again. Um, so we're just going to go over some quick community guidelines just to ensure that this space is safe and respectful throughout this event. And so um, again, we've set up this event to be respectful and center BIPOC youth voices. Um, so we've taken the precautions to ensure this. And so if there are any unwanted interruptions or Zoom bombing or anything along those lines, we have procedures in place to ensure that this space is safe moving forward. If you guys have any questions or concerns, please communicate uh, through the Zoom chat to the host and we'll be sure to take care of it. Um, again, so this meeting is being recorded. And so if you would not, or if you do not consent to being recorded, please turn off your cameras um, and you will not be captured. And so if you are keeping your camera on, this means that you consent to this to being recorded and being uploaded to the internet. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce um, Parliamentary Secretary Rachna Singh. Welcome, or welcome and thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. 
Thank you so much, Bella. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, David. Uh, I always enjoy this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I remember our conversation last year, uh, really, really amazing, such energy. And uh, so glad to be here today, joining you from the shared territories of Kwantlen, Creek Wetlam, Sami Amun Swasan, uh, and Katsi First Nations. And uh, I understand that we have a slideshow. We can uh, get that going and, uh, and I'll. So uh, as David mentioned, this week was really exciting uh, uh, for me, uh, definitely, but also for David, because it is, uh, uh, it is such a pleasure to work with him. Uh, he's usually, uh, won't say it from his mouth, but he is amazing human being, amazing minister. And I could not have asked for a better minister to work with. So a uh, lot of this work, um, uh, we we uh, we worked on it together. Uh, I uh, might seem the face of it. Uh, people might say Rachna has led it, but uh, I could not have done it without uh, David's support. So big thank you goes to him as well. So first slide, please. So uh, historically, what has happened um, that we know that there are inequities in our system, but uh, we have not in British Columbia, we have not uh, either collected the demographic data or if it was collected, it was not consistent. Uh, so there, was, there were calls from the communities uh, for a long time that they needed this disaggregated data, data that had the racial lens, uh, which is intersected with other, um, social factors uh, like your ethnicity, language, your uh, religion, uh, your head, uh, if you are wearing any uh, uh, head coverings or any, any symbol of faith, uh, your disability uh, or your gender identity. So that data BC did not collect, uh, but uh, we, we always used to refer to the uh, Stats Canada for that data, but not uh, coming from British Columbia. So this, uh, this whole uh, legislation is about that, collecting those important uh, racial factors that can help us identify uh, the inequities, the gaps, the barriers that the communities, especially the indigenous, black and racialized communities are facing while accessing core government services. Second slide, please. So this is, um, what communities were saying, and this is, uh, uh, I will just quote what Dr. June Francis, when she made, when we were making the announcement, she said that too, we cannot uh, work on something if we don't know about it. And that was the scenario in British Columbia. We all, like people were telling us, there were inequities, the experiences that they were having, especially accessing the services were different than the uh, uh, majority of the population. Uh, so, but because those inequities were not measured, they were, they were, the governments were also saying that we don't have anything, we don't see anything, then how can we work on it? Uh, but this, um, uh, this legislation is about better identifying where those gaps and barriers are, and also to provide equitable service to the communities, the service that all of us deserve, but some of, some, a lot of us are being left behind, but not uh, part, uh, it was not the equal treatment that the communities were, uh, were getting. So examples of like how this data can help, uh, obviously it will help uh, address the barriers or inequities in social programs. Like we are, uh, there are a number of uh, sectors that are resonating like uh, in the consultations that we have talked about, but this can be a really good program uh, for somebody who want to access rental assistance or uh, affordable childcare benefit. Uh, we have heard about like people, uh, how it can bring the change in the housing programs for the marginalized communities, also the healthcare. And I really want to focus a little bit on the healthcare. Few years ago, uh, a report came uh, from Dr. Maria Ellen Turple Lefond. Uh, it was called In Plain Sight. And the report talked about the indigenous uh, uh, communities and their experience with the healthcare system. 85% of the uh, people who responded in that report, they said that they, uh, the experience that they've had has been uh, discriminatory, unequal. Uh, and that report, I think, uh, made us all sit up and listen. And this legislation, a lot of the work that has happened in this le legislation, that report has provided the framework for this. Next slide, please. So, uh, 
because the, uh, we know that the communities were asking for this legislation, but it was, uh, we didn't want to do, uh, we just did not go and just uh, bring out this legislation without their consultation. They were the core, uh, they were in the center of this legislation and that's what we made sure. We started with our pre-consultation process that ha started happening in last yeah. April. We started meeting with the stakeholders in the communities from the indigenous black and the racialized communities and just wanted to know from them. We wanted to make this work as transparent as possible because historically what had happened, uh, the governments used to collect the data. They would collect the data. They won't involve the communities and they would use the data in a way that would further marginalize those communities, further stigmatize those com communities. So there was a, a lack of trust between those community partners and the government. So there was a lot of work ahead of us. We knew what we were trying to achieve, but we wanted to do it by keeping that partnership strong, uh, by having them, uh, by building that trust, by having them collaborate with us and uh, being our partners as we continue in that work. Um, so in first we started the pre-consultation and then in October of 2021, we formally launched our consultation process. Uh, one thing that we had heard, from in, heard in our pre-consultations was that the communities uh, did not want the government to come and do this work for them, do these consultations for them. They wanted to lead these con uh, conversations and these consultations. So that was a really important thing for us. So when we opened the consultations, it opened with, uh, with an online survey uh, that was available in more than 14 languages. But then also we made, uh, uh, we asked the communities to do these consultations. Uh, funding was made available for those. And more than 70 organizations participated in that, those consultations and more than 400 sessions uh, were held uh, as part of those consultations. Uh, along with that, there, were, uh, there was a separate consultation that was, being, that was held with the indigenous community partners, Métis Nation BC, uh, uh, and those were, like, those were separate set of consultations. So uh, in the end, more than 13,000 people participated in these consultations uh, that I, I would say is a, a one of its kind. It is one of, one of the most extensive consultations that we've had. Um, so uh, I was just speaking, uh, this is the next slide that talks about the engagement approach. So the First Nations, uh, uh, Métis Nation BC, BC Association of Ab Aboriginal Friendship Centers, Racialized Communities, and then obviously the online engagement report. So the one of, and it is one of the first bills that we have co-developed under the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. Uh, so uh, as you all might know that we introduced uh, our uh, uh, a historic bill in 2019, uh, DRIPA, and this is the, this bill is the first one that is co-developed, keeping all those, um, keeping that, that lens in mind. Next slide, please. So a uh, lot of people uh, get really worried because when they hear the term data, uh, because it can be very personal, it can be, uh, it can cause a lot of fear among people, like how this data will be collected. One thing that we heard from the community is that there is need to collect this data. 95% of them said, yes, it is high time that the government should be doing something about it, talking about those uh, inequities, but, uh, we are really worried also, uh, like how this will be collected. So uh, they told us that they don't want to give this information over and over again. They did not want to go, for example, at a healthcare setting and giving this information or to an ICBC office and giving this information to the frontline worker. And also like over and over again, because they have already given so much information to the government, they really wanted to be clear why this information is collected. So. Uh, the key uh, the key ways that we will be collecting this data, well, first of all, we wanted to make sure it's voluntary. It is not mandatory for anybody to give this information. We don't, anybody who's accessing the services and does not want to give the information, it won't become a barrier. They will still get the service. And because people are very comfortable with the, with the census style, because they have been filling the census surveys, uh, which is conducted by the federal government, they feel very comfortable doing that. So we will be, uh, we will be do collecting this data 
by a population survey, uh, which that will be led by BC stats. Uh, and as I said before, it won't be, uh, this data would won't, won't be collected at the front lines. Next slide, please. So that is another question. Um, how will we keep this data safe? Throughout this process, uh, uh, we have kept the, we have been, uh, we have been talking to the communities. We have kept them as our key partners. But along with that, we have worked very closely with our uh, Ministry of Citizen Services. Uh, they are uh, the data experts, as I say, uh, as I've found out a uh, lot of times, like I don't know the terms or, uh, or what goes into the data standards or initiatives. They are the people who have their pulse on that. Uh, so uh, we, uh, they will be, uh, even with the uh, uh, drafting the legislation, they, they were our key partners, but also when we start implementing this legislation, they will be keeping a close eye. Uh, and uh, also uh, we, will be, um, we will be setting the requirements to consider the identification, prevention, mitigation, and minimization of community harm, because that is something that has come from the community uh, uh, that has resonated in all of our consultations, uh, that we don't want this data and when this data is analyzed or then when this data is imparted, that it should not harm those communities. It should not further marginalize those communities. So uh, that lens has been uh, kept throughout the legislation of, of the community harm. We uh, also will be setting an anti-racism data committee. Uh, as soon as this uh, legislation gets uh, through, uh, we will be setting that, that up in the summer of this year. And that would be an independent committee, but that would be overlooking over the uh, implementation of this legislation. Uh, we'll be keeping the government accountable. We'll be checking like how that data is collected, uh, that uh, especially keeping the lens of community harm, that that is not happening. And Privacy and Human Rights Commissioner has given it a green light. So that is also extremely important. Human Rights Commissioner was uh, a key partner uh, uh, throughout the uh, process. Uh, we, we kept on having a number of meetings with her. She guided us through uh, a lot of uh, areas, especially the intersectional lens of the legislation. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, what people have been asking us. And uh, this is a question that uh, I'm very happy to say, uh, will it lead to any change in people's life? And uh, uh, I'm very happy to share that, yes, it is going to bring a lot of change. Uh, initially, uh, historically, as I've said before, that it is not that the governments have not collected the data. They have done it. In fact, like some communities have said that you have collected so much of our data, but we haven't seen any change. We haven't seen any concrete action plans coming out of it. So, but this data legislation is going to bring those changes. Next slide, please. Okay, maybe that's the end, uh, but... Uh, what I want to say, uh, uh, what I really want to reiterate is uh, that we are not uh, introducing this legislation or collecting this data for the sake of data. It is important that we, when we have those data, uh, as, as we will do the population survey and then the, uh, we will have uh, the staff uh, doing the data analysis. And the first report of that, uh, what we heard, uh, what we saw what, when we collected the data, the first report of that would be coming up. In, we are hoping to have that report in May of 2023. That would be a public report. That would be uh, uh, that would be open to the public to see like where are what are the areas? What have uh, what have the communities told us? What has that data shown us? And uh, it will sh sh shed light on where those inequities, where those barriers are. And that is just the first step. We we will make that report available, but then. It is up to us, I think, uh, we, uh, we, we should be made accountable uh, as government that what we are going to do after that. We have collected the data, we have told people where those inequities are. And a lot of times you will notice those inequities, uh, the communities have been saying, talking about those inequities for a number of years. But then uh, next year when we will have that report that that is a concrete evidence of those inequities and those discrepancies that communities are facing. And then the real work starts, the policy work that would be cross uh, government uh, that we'll be, we will be starting. And uh, uh, so that's, that's what this legislation is. Uh, I think it's a historic legislation that communities have asked for. And uh, we have brought it uh, with uh, 
but this is the first part of the legislation that we have, as I, I, I talked about in, the, in our last conversation last year as well, that this is the first legislation that we are bringing in. Uh, after this legislation, the broader Anti-Racism Act is also coming in 2023. Uh, and that is, uh, I always say it makes me so proud, especially working in, with David in Ministry of Attorney General, that we are using this anti-racism lens, uh, uh, working towards making British Columbia an anti-racist province. Um, we would be one of the first provinces in Canada to be doing the work that we are doing. It's historic. The whole of Canada is looking at us. And a uh, lot of work has been done, friends, but a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, I'm so thankful for this opportunity of sharing uh, this legislation with you. Uh, but uh, really would like to hear from you as well. Thank you so much. That was very educational. I learned a lot. So thank you, Rashna, for that great presentation. Um, so we're going to head into a Q&A portion of the event. A um, couple ground rules. How it's going to work is if you have a question, please raise your hand in the Zoom chat function. Um, if you have any questions on how to do that, please message our Q&A. It's this Q&A person on the Zoom um, if anyone has any questions. Um, and I will call on you. Um, please ensure that these questions are related to the content that Rachna shared today. Um, and if you have other questions relating to other issues, you can use a Google form that we'll send out at the end of the event and we'll get back to you um, with your, any answers. Um, if you're not comfortable asking questions yourself, you can message the Q&A chat on the Zoom and um, Emily, who's sitting right next to me, Emily can answer those questions uh, or ask the questions on your behalf. Um, so yeah, if you guys, when you start, could just say a little bit your name, a little bit of context to who you are, your affiliation, that'd be really great. And we're gonna start it off with Kevin. All right, I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Thank you, Bella. Thank you everyone for hosting. Uh, I think this is really lovely opportunity to talk about the new legislation and just I'm really looking forward to the discussions we'll be having. Um, so as Bella said, my name is Kevin. Um, over the past year, I've been working with a lawyer, Stephen No, on uh, hate crime reporting and how to make it more accessible and easier for people in British Columbia to report hate crimes. Um, we've been making a really good process with uh, now the VPD allowing online reporting in multiple languages, but we're looking to extend this to expand it province wide um, and eventually nationwide to make sure that uh, it can play a key role in anti racism. Uh, with that said, here's my first question um, Collecting data is a good start, but data with no policy changes won't lead to any meaningful action. The real change that we need is to see amendments to the criminal code regarding hate motivated crimes. What is the provincial government currently doing about this? And have they or will they be engaging in consultations with the Federal Department of Justice? As shown in the recent case with Jamie Bizenson, the community is clearly dismayed by the lack of a hate crime charge. Well, you Rachna, Rachna, yeah, you, you, you can take whichever piece. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I can just advise. Uh, and and I, first I wanted to say thanks to Kevin. Kevin uh, has done a lot of work uh, on this issue uh, in our community. Very grateful, Kevin, to you and your team for the efforts on this, uh, making sure that people are able to bring forward uh, what happened to them, to police, and that it's more accessible. I was astonished uh, when you shared that uh, that uh, the the hate crime reporting uh, was only in uh, in English, and so uh, that, uh, that that was a barrier to a lot of people. So thanks for your work on that. Um, the uh, uh, We've been uh, engaged with the federal uh, attorney general on this issue. I understand from him that the feds do have some uh, legislation coming forward. The big challenge with hate crimes is proving the motivation of the person who committed the crime. So uh, we can look at an incident like uh, the uh, food bank in Surrey, uh, the services, uh, uh, services that might be delivered by a religious community that get, keep getting attacked. Uh, and uh, and, um, and say, well, th this seems to be uh, informed by the fact that they're delivered by a particular religious community. Uh, but the police will say, well, how do we prove that that's why this uh, uh, facility was vandalized over and over? And so that's the challenge um, of the existing provisions uh, when it comes to Crown Council for them to <laughs> approve charges. And so that's something we've been communicating with the federal government is, look, if you wanna make sure that um, 
the courts are able to consider hate as an element of the crime, we need to make sure that the elements of the offense are something that police can actually gather evidence for and, and demonstrate to the court. So that's on that really specific issue. Rachna, on the broader issue of, uh, of yeah. how this legislation is going to make a difference. Yes, I know. Thank you so much, Kevin. And I remember uh, having a conversation with both you and Stephen and amazing work that you have done. Uh, that is much needed. On this uh, uh, legislation, you are, you are right, like the policy work needs to come. Uh, but on the hate crimes, like we have heard from the people, especially about the stricter penalties and the clear de definition of hate crimes. And as I mentioned, uh, our broader anti-racism act, which we would be starting the consultations on, uh, that is something that is an area that we will be that can be discussed there too. We would really like to hear from the communities what would they like to see in that app. Uh, in New Zealand, where they have the anti-racism app, they are just they are focusing on hate crimes and the definition of hate crimes and the penalties related to that. Uh, but <clears throat> also, I really want to talk about the two approaches to anti-racism. Like uh, one is the proactive, and other is reactive. Uh, uh, hate crime and uh, uh, the penalties uh, to that, uh, changes to criminal code, uh, much needed, no question about it. But also like we have to do some proactive work also. Uh, the education, uh, we have heard over and over again and uh, from all the our consultations that education is the key, like bringing changes to the education or making anti-racism education mandatory, that is also coming up. So this is would be part of the second uh, uh, legislation, uh, the anti broader anti-racism act. I would really like to hear from uh, from you, Kevin, definitely, and many more. And what would they like to see in that anti-racism act? First time ever in British Columbia that would be coming, uh, and that would be an opportunity for us to bring in the changes uh, that are much required. Great, thank you so much. I think Kevin, you have a second question you want to ask. Yeah, thank you, thank you both for your replies. Um, the second question is. Language is a barrier throughout the justice system and not only when it comes to hate crime reporting. How does the government plan to address this in the upcoming legislation? Can you give me an example, Kevin, of, uh, of what you're um, referring to? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess the one I'm familiar with obviously is in the hate crimes with the lack of um, alternative languages, you know, Chinese, for example. Oh, I see, uh, language, yeah. as opposed to the words people use, the specific yeah. languages. Yeah, so, yeah in terms of the specific, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. So when people are in court uh, for their first appearance, it can sometimes be challenging to have a translator ready for them, especially if they don't have a lawyer. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing is uh, increasing access to legal aid across the province so that people are able to get legal advice about their problems and they have someone who supports them in understanding what their rights are, including having a translator present in the court because it uh, has to be arranged in advance to make sure that they're able to understand what's happening. There are two groups of people that uh, we think about in this situation. One is uh, the person who's facing the charge. The other is the victim. Uh, so uh, often, and especially when you're talking about hate crimes, the victim and their supporters uh, may not speak English as a first language and uh, may have difficulty following the technical language that's taking place in the courtroom in English. And so they need translation. And so uh, we have had to work with some families to make sure that they have uh, translation support through victim services, through public safety and solicitor general. And uh, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's an important uh, victim service and not every cultural group knows that uh, they can access through victim services this kind of support. Um, and so part of the work that we have in government communications is to increase the translation of our online materials so that people know what services are available, not just this service, but all government services. Uh, so for example, uh, we've made a commitment recently to add Urdu to uh, our languages that uh, we're doing translation of materials in and uh, in a cross government effort to increase the number of translated materials. And also our government access lines now have access to um, on the health uh, side through uh, uh, provincial health authority, uh, over 200 languages in real time translation. So we're slowly uh, um, moving through government to make language uh, access more available. Um, Rachna, uh, do you have any uh, feedback from your communities of uh, outreach about um, issues related to translation and how data might be able to help that? Yeah, no, that is uh, very important. Uh, I think the languages, uh... We want to make the, the services accessible for everybody, right? So uh, the reason we are doing this disaggregated data, uh, one of the factors that we are, social factors that we are adding in there is the language. 
like if if your language is a barrier in accessing the services that you uh, that you were seeking so that would really shed light like what are the areas that we are language a lot of times i know there are translators uh, available there are uh, especially if i talk about sari memorial hospital you will get a lot of uh, material in punjabi or hindi on, on on the major languages that are being spoken but we would really like to know from that data also i think it will shed a uh, really important light on that kevin uh, and uh, uh, to talk about like if we need to translate our materials or if we want to make our services more accessible in different languages uh, i think that would be uh, that we will all come to see once we have the first report. That sounds great. Thank you both again for your time. Thank you, Kevin, for your great questions. Thank you. We're next going to go to Malia, who has a couple of questions. Hi, Malia. Uh oh, we can't hear you. Oh, there we sorry. Go. <laughs> uh, so um, I am Malia. Uh, I am here. Um, I'm part of the Stronger BC um, Young Leaders Council. And, um, you know, I'm 16. I am very young. And um, I, so my first question is, is the data being collected from um, multiple age demographics and then going to be separated into different racialized groups? So yeah, it would be in a population uh, survey uh, kind survey. It would be uh, it would be collected. Age would be there, like uh, uh, like your aggregated data is all there. But also like combining with the racial factors, like your ethnicity, your religion, language spoken. So that's how this data that survey would go. The population survey. Uh, David, if you have anything more to add in this. Well, one of the parts of the legislation um, that is really important is within any particular racialized group, there's different uh, uh, groups as well. And so there's, you know, uh, uh, people with disabilities, or there are younger people, or seniors, or women and men, or gender diverse people. And so the what the legislation talks about is um, intersectional analysis, which basically means if you have different characteristics, does that affect your ability to access these services? So it looks like if we look at the whole racialized group uh, on the data that we were asked to collect, it looks like everybody's accessing the government service. But when we break it out by age, it turns out that young people from this group are not accessing the service for some way. So that's why the data gets really powerful is we can say, okay, well, we know that young people aren't accessing this service from this racialized group. Now we can really focus our efforts on identifying why. Let's reach out, let's figure out what the gap is that's preventing people from accessing that service in the same way. So the data is definitely about um, collecting that race information or that religious uh, uh, information about the individual to, to look at that big picture but it also goes into those different characteristics that might influence whether or not you're able to access the service. Um, uh, Malia, can I just say uh, how cool it is that you're 16 and doing this call tonight and, uh, and asking great questions like this, thanks. It's amazing, Malia. Great, do you wanna ask your second question? Uh, sure, yeah. So my second question is, is the data going to be collected at a constant rate? Like for example, every three months, six months or every year? Like once a year? We are hoping uh, it would be a population survey uh, this year. Um, and it would be at regular intervals. Like it is, and the first report, as I said, would be coming out in the May of 2023. Uh, but those population surveys will keep on happening uh, so that we have more information. Uh, and also uh, that the reports, I think, are very, very important that uh, once we analyze those data and uh, find out the inequities. Uh, uh, it is important for the public to know where those inequities are, how the data was analyzed. And it, so it would be a transparent process. It would be a continuous process that will keep on happening. Great, thank you so much for those questions and those answers. We're thank next you, Malia. To, thank you. We're next to go to Prab Noor. Great. Um, hello, thank you so much for taking your time to um, come and talk with us. Um, yeah, I'm probably where I'm a member of the Stronger BC or Young Leaders Council, and I'm 17 years old from Prince George. And um, my question is, um, what is the type of data that will be collected? Yeah, 
That's that's a great question, Prabhnoor. Thank you so much. Uh, so right now, what is happening, Prabhnoor, is um, that uh, uh, the aggregated data that usually when you go to any any public uh, anywhere, the data that is collected is usually your age, your name, and your gender. And uh, but the disaggregated factors, like other factors that make my identity, uh, are not collected. For example, if I talk about myself, uh, I'm a woman. Uh, uh, I, I'm in my late 40s, uh, and then, <laughs> uh, but nobody's uh, talking about like I'm a South Asian woman, uh, or um, what my religion is, uh, what language do I speak, uh, whether I have, uh, for example, if I've if I've had any disability, uh, or if I belong to uh, any uh, LGBTQS plus uh, category. So that is the data that we are not collecting at this time. BC is not collecting. That. So this is the difference. This is like one, uh, the aggregated data is collected. A lot of it is like all that data is available already in the systems, but not the disaggregated one. And that's what this population survey will do. Uh, uh, using, uh, uh, trying to find your racial, uh, the racial identity, but uh, combined in, a, in an intersectional way, as David has already pointed out. Like what, how, what defines my identity? There might be other oppressing factors that can impact my identity. Somebody who's wearing a turban, like my father wears a turban. He's an older South Asian male wearing a turban. He understands English, but there are a lot of people in Surrey, and I'm sure there are in Prince George, a South Asian male who don't understand the language, right? So is that creating a barrier for them while they are accessing the services? Or an indigenous person who goes there but just by their identity, just by because they are indigenous, the stereotypes that we have, the colonial structures that we have, they uh, it is like uh, uh, while they ac access the services, there's a lot of discrimination that they face. So all those inequities uh, cannot be measured. Those are happening on everyday basis. We hear about it in some kind of news coming out, especially up in North. We had this news about a kitty mat woman uh, going to different hospitals in one day she was pregnant and she she did not get the service and then she had a stillborn baby. Why did it happen to us, an indigenous woman? Why? Her identity, I think, was an important factor in that, in the in the in the in the, in the treatment that she was getting. Uh, so I'm just giving you one uh, broad example. There's there would be many other areas that, that go hidden, that don't come out, that, that we never notice, that we never talk about. So that this is what this data is going to do for us. Uh, shed light on those inequities. You have another Thank question, Prabhnu? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Watch out for that bear. <laughs> bear problems in Prince that. George. Yeah. I had no idea. Great. Next question is from Alexandra. Hello, Alexandra. Hello. Thank you both so much for taking the time to come here. And thank you to the Vancouver Council for making this possible. Um, I just want to say congratulations for this new legislator. I'm super excited for it. And I know that a lot of good things are going to come for it. So come from it. So I have two quick questions. And my first one is I was just wondering what the budget has been while collecting the data and what it's planning to be as you, you know, analyze it and then you make the necessary adjustments that you're expecting to? So this is a, uh, uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, we made sure when we were doing the consultation that we have the funding for those consultations. We didn't want the communities uh, to give us the, all this information without providing them the funding. So that was very, very important for step, like the extent, as I've already talked about the extensive consultation that we did, that was attached with funding. Uh, it is a cross uh, a government uh, uh, a, a, a program, like obviously the legislation has come from the Ministry of Autonomy General, uh, from the anti-racism branch, but this is not just limited to our branch, it is like uh, across the government, uh, uh, Thing that we have to look into, and it would be uh, the budget will be coming from the core ministries. Uh, and as the work progresses, you are very right, Alexandria, that we uh, there would be uh, funding asked for it and funding given by the Treasury Board. Already, uh, we are looking into like uh, how what what you, what it would take 
to especially implement this legislation because now the real work starts and that uh, more funding is being secured for that. All right, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. And my second, actually, sorry, I also forgot to introduce myself a bit more. I am 18 and I'm from Coquitlam and I am a part of the BC, Stronger BC Youth Council as well. So my second question kind of into how I've been trying to get involved in politics and how you also said that this is across different parts of the government. So I was just wondering if the idea of you know collecting the data and seeing the necessity for it is also going to be implemented within the government itself. Are you looking at the race of the people that the MLAs that make up the legislative? Are you looking at um, the people that work within there? Are you also trying to set like be the role model for the rest of the province so that it's easier to understand how important it is and the effects that collecting this the segregated data can have? Absolutely. And that's a really, really good question. When you look at the uh, both sides of the government, uh, both sides of the legislature, uh, uh, and you will see the difference. Uh, if you look on the NDP side, it's like one of the most diverse groups that we have. Uh, uh, the most number of uh, racialized MLAs on this side, more women, like we are a majority women caucus. A uh, lot has been done, but a lot more needs to be done. Like, like there needs to be more representation of more marginalized communities, how to bring them up. Uh, and when I uh, say that, like more black uh, representation is needed uh, as Muslim re representation. Um, there are some, uh, some, uh, uh, and I'm sure the party is looking into that. Like this is like, we keep on telling them uh, whenever I have any conversation with the party, I make sure I keep on telling them uh, that British Columbia is changing. Our demographics are changing, and that our legislature should represent that. A lot of work has been done, uh, but a lot more work needs to be done. And I think this legislation would be a key for that as well. But within the government, I always, uh, I also would like to say that uh, uh, we did an audit um, uh, that is still on. Like we haven't got the results for that, but it is uh, work that we are doing within the public service as well. Like. What, how, how, what does our public uh, servants look like? Uh, and um, when we first started, it was uh, in 2017, it was majority white people working because that's how the system is made. Like it's a very, very colonial uh, system, but now we are changing it. We are uh, making sure uh, the ADM, the assistant deputy minister who worked on this legislation, she's one of the few black public servants that we have in our uh, public service. So changes are coming. Uh, I won't say that it's at optimum level, uh, much more needs to be done, but we have a lens to that. We are using uh, uh, to, that to advocate for it and push for that change. To your, to your question, Alexander, just a little bit more. Uh, we do track um, diversity in the public service, all those uh, employees of government, the thousands and thousands of people who work for government, there's a self-disclosure uh, survey. We also track government appoints, we directly appoint boards and tribunals. So these are kind of the governing bodies for uh, post-secondary schools and crown corporations and, and so on. Uh, and we have been uh, uh, really improving the diversity of those boards. Some of our successes are, you know, every post-secondary school in British Columbia has at least one uh, indigenous uh, member right now. Uh, we've uh, dramatically increased diversity in those boards and tribunals. And, uh, and as Rachna said, uh, you know, the most diverse uh, uh, group of MLAs ever elected within the NDP, uh, exciting times. And, uh, and uh, also as Rachna said, yeah, more to do, but we do track that carefully. Uh, and uh, because uh, those, those metrics help us uh, figure out if we're going the right way in terms of representing the province uh, in terms of uh, both people who are elected, but also appointed. Thank you both for answering my questions. That definitely shed a lot more light. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Alexander, for those questions. Um, we're next gonna turn to Leona, who has a question. Hi, Leona. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions, actually. And But first, my name is Leona Brown. I am Gitsan through my parents, Earl and Caroline of New Hazleton area, um, and Nishka through my grandparents, um, Harold and Elizabeth Wright of New Ianch. And I am, I consider myself a refugee to these territories of um, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish. And 
I sit on the Vancouver DPAC um, Black and Indigenous Working Group, as well as the Indigenous Education Council um, and the DPAC in general. So I'm, I wanted to ask you, what is the, is there an Indigenous focus to this survey? Um, I'm, I'm assuming there might be, but also to the, I'm listening to you talking about this will be legislation. So would there be an Indigenous focus on that too and how to relate to Indigenous people in collecting a survey as well and, and making it a safe place, not only for Indigenous, but you know the people of color in general? No, that is, that's a really good question. And uh, um, I was very proud. Uh, uh, I am, we both, David and I are very proud that uh, this was the first uh, legislation that we have co-developed with our First Nation partners. Uh, throughout the process, they were, uh, they were key uh, partners. Uh, and as I mentioned during my presentation also, that it was very important to have them uh, along with us uh, because number of times, uh, data was collected, never consulting the indigenous and First Nation communities, uh, and but we didn't want this to be uh, to be happening with this legislation. Uh, and uh, so they are key partners, and not just till the uh, uh, till the introduction of the legislation, they will continue to work with us uh, as we implement this legislation. David, if you have more to say. Just uh, that the, the partners uh, were the First Nations Leadership Council and also um, direct uh, uh, nations were involved as well as urban indigenous organizations. Um, so there were multiple um, uh, groups involved in developing this legislation. Okay, um, if I could just add one more question. I know there's a time crunch, but um, some of my questions were answered already, but I really wanna see the indigenous focus and how it translates into legislation and making our community safe because um, as you can see from probably many questions and answers, groups, there's not very many indigenous rep representation available. So how, do, how, does, um, how are you making the survey more accessible, I guess, to indigenous? And, and I'm thinking like even with all the other um, races that, that you, you know, we, we've been groomed to not like answer all these demographic questions. And now, mm -hmm. we're, now we're asked to put them so that you get an idea of like the population um, that's affected by it. Are you going to put like that disclaimer in there and saying it's really important to have this survey and then um, giving the option to maybe also indigenous input and in, in how to um, I mean, we're, we're at the bottom of the totem pole for indigenous people and like replying to questions and for giving input at this day and age, we've already been groomed that no matter what we do and say it, we're gonna be ignored, nothing's gonna happen. So how do you create that safe space to allow our input in a higher number? Absolutely. And that has been the key, uh, the trust uh, was broken, uh, so to building uh, to build that trust is extremely important, and that's what we have been doing uh, with our pre-consultations, with our consultations, and also like keeping those partners along with us as we go. Uh, even when we uh, introduce our population survey, we don't want to just send out the population survey and just hope that people will uh, answer those questions. Uh, we would really need the support of our. Uh, First Nation partners, uh, the First Nation Leadership Council, uh, 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 the individual nations will keep them on board and have conversation with them that how we can get the best possible responses from them. And if there's any other ways, like a lot of times the population survey, how how is how to make that population survey accessible for those communities as well? That would that is the lens that we are also uh, uh, that that is another aspect that we are looking into. But as I said, this whole process was transparent in partnership with, with the indigenous partners. And this partnership will continue as we do the population survey. And also when we are bringing out our reports uh, uh, related to that survey, they will be our key partners and uh, uh, collaborators uh, within this legislation. That's right. Yeah, thanks very much, Leona. Great questions. Okay, we're, we have a 
little bit more time left for question. We're going to take one from Sahad or Sahad next. Hi there. Hi, David. Hi, Rajna. Thank you so hey, much. For, yeah, th thank you so much. I just want to say thanks so much for your work on this. Uh, that's a super huge accomplishment uh, for the province. And it's also a huge first step for Canada. Uh, I had a question around, you know, what impact this, you know, this would have on programs and services like post-secondary education, uh, whether that's, you know, in terms of student financial aid, admissions, general accessibility. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Great question. Uh, uh, in a lot of responses that uh, uh, in our consultations that we have seen, one of the key sectors that has emerged uh, uh, is is education. Uh, the uh, how to make it more accessible uh, for the racialized Black and Indigenous communities, and that will uh, once we have those numbers, uh, it would be. Uh, uh, putting those numbers into like who is accessing our uh, education system. Uh, we have heard so many times that the Black Indigenous people are not able to get into the post-secondary uh, education system because of the barriers that they are facing, whether those are financial barriers or they are social barriers. So that would be an important uh, area for us to explore, uh, but uh, uh, really good question because education has been emerging as one of the key uh, uh, key areas, the core areas that uh, people have pointed us uh, pointed that to us a number of times. Yeah, it's really important to think about this legislation as a framework that can be applied across a number of different ministries, advanced education, education, public safety, Solicitor General, Ministry of Attorney General, housing. It's, it's uh, meant to be uh, to set those minimum standards and establish that trust uh, for a community that whatever the areas that we're looking at, it's consistent. Awesome. Thanks for the question, man. Great. If we have one more time, Sid has his hand raised. Yeah, Sid's been very patient. I've seen him. <laughs> He's been at the top of my bar there. Great. Hey, there we go. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you on this legislative initiative. I think it's a very important one. Uh, I'm the Sid Schneid, I'm the Vice President of the West Coast Coalition Against Racism and a founding member of Independent Jewish Voices Canada. I'm uh, led to believe that the draft legislation does not define racism, and I'm wondering if you could explain your rationale for taking that position. So good to see you, Sid, uh, uh, and uh, uh, really good to have you here. Uh, the rationale for not having that, uh, because we, and I, I'm sure David, uh, he's a lawyer, he, 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 he can explain it in a better way. Uh, we did not want to uh, use the term, uh, the, the language, the, the language for the, or the definition for racism uh, in the legislation, because that uh, definition can change and it can mean different for different people. Uh, and uh, so we didn't want it to be in, uh, prescribed in the legislation uh, and which we cannot take out afterwards. And uh, uh, that's the rationale uh, that I, uh, I feel that it was not there, but over to David and he can explain it in a better way. Yeah, the key idea behind the uh, legislation is anti-racist, but the legislation itself is to collect racialized data. Uh, and so, it's not necessary to define it for the legislation. And, and one of the reasons to be disinclined uh, to do that is it uh, can be a really intense divisive uh, issue for some communities, mm -hmm. how racism is defined. And we wanted to bring people together in conversations about how do we collect this data respectfully? How do we get this information about how people are accessing services or how they're being excluded from services? Um, and, uh, and we found we didn't need it for the legislation. And so um, we uh, we uh, uh, proceeded without uh, uh, defining the term, knowing that the collection of this data and how we intend to use it will be profoundly anti-racist. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sid. Thank nice you, to see Sid. You. Great, thank you so much, Sid. With that, we're going to end our Q and A, and I understand there are questions that haven't been answered yet. But please, sorry, but please get back to us and we will answer your questions after the event. Um, so I'm gonna pass it on to Emily to close out the event. Hi, um, thank you so much to everyone for participating. We really appreciate your questions and ideas. 
A big thank you to Rajna and David for all the information you both have provided, as well as for your time and effort. Thank you to our tech crew, Eduardo and James from Event Lab as well. As mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure we're improving this event in the future, as we're hoping to organize one on climate change, homelessness, and anti-poverty policy soon. So it would be very helpful to get your feedback. We are providing a link in the Zoom chat to a Google form where you can give us feedback. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Bella. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Till next time. Bye.